Okay, going to uh, move on to another hemorrhage topic, and this is one um, essentially talking about the application in your practice of a large randomized control trial that was published last year in the spring, um, slight, right after this meeting, if I recall. Um, it's essentially was the woman trial, the use of tranexamic acid in, as a therapeutic intervention in obstetric hemorrhage. Um, the purpose of my talk is I want to talk a little bit about prophylactic use of this drug. I want to present the results of the WOMAN trial, which was a therapeutic intervention. Talk about safety. I'll talk a little bit about cost, I suppose. Um, but I think the important question for you is, you probably have a hemorrhage protocol at your institution and you're wondering how to incorporate this new information. Um, it's not yet in our guidelines. It's just starting to creep in. Um, and I would say that there's not consensus yet exactly where it is. But let's start with a little bit of consensus formation, or at least data collection. I want, I'm going to poll the audience um, and just see where everyone is at in their practice currently. I suspect many of you use tranexamic acid in other aspects of your anesthetic practice. How many of you use tranexamic acid prophylactically in joint replacement? Okay, as I suspected, just about everyone in the room. All right, I'm gonna poll the audience now. So this is the use of tranexamic acid for cesarean delivery. Okay, so I have a couple of options up here. Some are prophylactic use, some are therapeutic. How many of you um, would say you have never used or have almost never used tranexamic acid in an obstetric, uh, in a cesarean delivery? Okay, 20 to 30% of the office. How many of you have used tranexamic acid at the th stage that you perhaps were in massive transfusion protocol? Probably two thirds to three quarters of the room. How many have used it as a second tier intervention? I will define that perhaps as, as you're transitioning from first uterotonic to second um, or some escalation in your protocol. Okay, uh, it's a little bit less defined, but I would say a third are using. How many have used it prophylactically in a high risk case, such as 20% of the room? How many have used, how many are using it prophylactically in all your cesarean deliveries? Okay, not a single hand. I wasn't sure how that one would go. Okay, do we have a sense of where we stand in terms of practice within our group here? Um, I'm gonna poll, um, I'm gonna poll you at the end with this exact same question, but essentially reviewing some of the data if it's gonna change um, how you look at this or how you practice. Um, to give you some background, this is a, a synthetic analog developed by a Japanese researcher. If you are a woman, um, Scientist, um, this is a great story of someone who overcame some odds in a very male-dominated environment. She essentially was underfunded. She described um, presenting her first results on tranexamic acid to a room that probably looked like this. When she, a woman got up on the stage, everyone, all the men walked out. They didn't want to hear what she had to say. Um, fortunately, you can see she lived until um, 2016, which were the, she literally died the last the month of the last recruitment into the woman trial. But she had already lived long enough to see that this molecule she synthesized on a shoestring budget with substantial bias against her as a woman scientist became a World Health Organization um, top drug to have available in your medical practice. I think other things that are important, number one, mechanism. This, uh, as you know, is an inhibitor of plasminogen activation. I'll walk you through a little bit of what those pathways look like. Um, it is a renally excreted drug, so you need to be a little bit more thoughtful about the use of this drug and perhaps its dosing in a patient who has um, impaired renal um, function. You will not find any guidance of this in the ASA guidelines. Uh, I participated in the development of these guidelines, which were now three years ago. I'll show you where we were three years ago. There was really good evidence, in, certainly in the worlds of cardiac and orthopedics. Um, I think it reflects the practice of what, when I raised your hand, was asking how many of you use this uh, drug prophylactically for your joint replacements. There's great evidence. Category A1, multiple randomized control trials that show benefit. Also, category A2, beneficial evidence in seven randomized controlled trials that show this drug is safe. Anytime you manipulate this, uh, the coagulation cascade, you're, you could argue you're playing with fire. 
you're walking between hemorrhage deaths and thromboembolic deaths. Um, we don't take it lightly. And that's certainly how we were looking at this evidence, forming these guidelines. Um, the basis for um, this in terms of the relative risks and risk reduction looked great. We felt very comfortable with recommending tranexamic acid prophylactically for those settings. But if you look at the language, we talked about, we thought that there might be value to its use in other high-risk uh, circumstances for excessive bleeding. The bottom um, line there is my language. I still had real fears that the generalist who practices anesthesia is going to read this and say, well, other high-risk environments, that sounds like obstetrics, would employ it and we would end up with unintended thromboembolic uh, complications and perhaps deaths. That's how this looked three years ago. Um, in terms of therapeutic transexamic acid, to give you something once you start bleeding and you're in trouble, we had very little evidence out there uh, at that time um, other than to say you should be considering this. And again, the recommendation and concern about um, hypercoagulable patients such as pregnant patients. Um, so what do we know about um, coagulation physiology? Surprisingly less than we probably should. I think it's an area, if you are an investigator, it's a great place to dig in. You can probably make a mark without um, an enormous amount of effort. Um, it's, it's been hard to define it. What we do know, it, what you know about it already is obstetric hemorrhage, um, what you observe is disproportional coagulopathy relative to the amount of blood loss, certainly compared to surgical bleeding that you manage across your practice, including penetrating trauma. It just looks very different. You end up coagulopathic at lower levels of blood loss. It probably has something to do with um, the amount of surface area present in a placenta uh, immediately after it separates. Um, we know there's a great, there's a release of tissue factor into the bloodstream that uh, increases a whole cascade of activity um, that also, you know, to some degree influences um, fibrinolytic activity. Um, remember, tranexamic acid is a inhibitor of plasminogen. So if you think about clot formation, and this is really not probably a great example for a placental separation, but you'll have fibrin forming, fibrinogen converted into fibrin, um, Tranexamic acid inhibits the uh, plasminogen to plasmin conversion, what starts to break away those fibrin clots. What you'll have is liberation of fibrin degradation products known as D-dimers. So the things that we know and the things that Alex Botwick was describing this last talk was in measuring these things with um, traditional coagulation tests or um, um, thromboelastography or elastometry is your, you know, some of the things we're thinking about in traditional tests is fibrinogen level, um, fibrin split products. What do we know in trials? Not too much uh, either here. Anne-Sophie um, Ducroix uh, Boothers in France has done some investigations and she has some ongoing investigations on some dose studies related to tranexamic acid. Um, but I'll tell you what some of her preliminary work showed. Um, data she presented from 10 years ago on postpartum hemorrhage patients um, that they enrolled 800 mLs into blood loss. They gave tranexamic acid therapeutically. Note the doses here, okay? Four gram bolus and an infusion of one gram an hour. Just um, reflect on that as we go through some subsequent data. She also had a control group she compared this to who did not have hemorrhage. They measured traditional coagulation studies at a baseline and at 30, minute, um, 30 minutes, 120, and, 100, and 360 minutes. Compared to women who did not hemorrhage, the control patients, as expected, you saw decreases in fibrinogen, platelet levels, and an increase in these liberated D-dimer levels. Um, if you gave tranexamic acid in the doses described, they saw a decrease in D-dimers. Again, you should see less plasminogen converted to plasmin, less liberation of um, this, these fibrin products, and stabilization of your fibrinogen levels in the bloodstream. All of these are what you'd expect in terms mechanistically now shown in um, hemorrhaging patients. And if you look at this on a graph, these are D-dimers, these liberated fibrin split products in patients who received tranexamic acid um, is this group, 
So reduced levels versus those that continued to hemorrhage and liberate split products. So it appears to be doing what it needed to be doing in the patient population we take care of. To back up a little bit, let's look at randomized controlled trials of the use of this drug. This is in the setting of prophylaxis. Caesarean delivery, um, there have been many trials randomizing women just like um, some of the trials in orthopedics and cardiac surgery. Give them um, some dose of tranexamic acid before cesarean delivery. These were healthy patients. Um, what was observed um, was a reduction in blood loss and a reduction in the number of patients who had large hemorrhages. Um, however, a lot of these trials were described to be of low quality. And I think when you look at this, this is a meta-analysis that I think does a little bit better job of actually vetting the quality of these studies and pairs it down to what I think are eight or nine of these trials would describe, yes, there is a reduction in hemorrhage in the average cesarean delivery patient um, when given prophylactically. In the last study I showed you, it said it would, on average, save you 78 mLs of blood. This um, higher quality meta-analysis actually showed a little bit stronger effect, 160 mL blood loss savings. What does this mean to you? Um, perhaps in any other specialty that we practice in, this would be immediate adopt. Why not administer a drug that's relatively low in cost? By the way, one gram cost about $115 to $120 IV in the US. Why wouldn't you give that, even with moderate benefit? Primarily because we were worried about increasing thromboembolic risk, complications, and even death. Um, we know that the leading cause of death in the United States are, well, number four on the list is hemorrhage. 11.4% of women in the United States die from hemorrhage. 9.2% um, die of thromboembolism. Um, it could very likely result that in your attempt to save 160 mLs of blood loss, which may or may not be meaningful in different subsets of patients, um, you could be reducing the hemorrhagic death bar here at a cost of increasing the thromboembolic. So that's how all of this looked to us up until a year ago. Um, why are patients who are pregnant more prone to thromboembolic, uh, thromboembolism? Uh, not entirely known. You know, it's a little bit of a teleologic benefit, right, to save one's life so they don't bleed to death before modern medicine. This is a study from the National Inpatient Sample that's about a decade and a half old. But generally what was observed in pregnant versus non-pregnant um, women is that about one in 600 developed some thrombotic complication. Obviously, many of these are not lethal. But the lethal complications were about a 1 in 90,000 women through a catastrophically large blood clot and killed, uh, and, and they died. And they contributed to what is 9.2% of maternal deaths in the US, at least currently. Coincid um, counterintuitively, the in this study, the largest risk for thrombosis was hemorrhage. You know, what do you make of that? You could interpret it in a couple different ways. Um, patients who are hemorrhaging, there's a lot going on. Probably a lot of this is very pro-inflammatory that in itself has different risk factors. But it also raises the question about how we manage hemorrhage. We probably do a reasonable amount of over-treating it. And that could contribute to some of the thrombotic risk. So the highest risk group in this entire sample were those patients who were bleeding, which is odd. Again, um, so this is the woman trial. 20,060 women randomized. It's a therapeutic trial. Let me important to, to comment on that. This is not prophylactic. Therapeutic. Women were hemorrhaging. Um, this was in many countries around the world. It was a combination of high and, re low, and low resource environments. The overwhelming number of patients that were enrolled in this trial were in low resource environments. Um, they received, when they hemorrhaged, uh, tranexamic acid in a dose of one gram plus another one gram if there was no response. So a, a one to two grams total. Two boluses, no infusion, versus a placebo. The primary outcome in the original design of the study was a composite one of death or hysterectomy, and numerous uh, meaningful secondary outcomes were evaluated. This was the, the group that was putting this trial out had already put out the CRASH-2 trial for you, which probably changed your practice. That was the use of 
therapeutic tranexamic acid in the setting of hemorrhagic trauma. It was demonstrated to reduce um, death from bleeding in, in uh, bleeding trauma patients when it was administered before they'd gotten to a, an emergency resuscitation. Uh, the woman trial was really the second big trial that they were publishing. These trials had very similar methodology, almost identical. Um, interestingly, these two are now published and are changing practice. Two others that have just finished accrual of patients, use of tranexamic acid and traumatic brain injury and GI bleeding, are finished but not published. Look for those in the near future. So uh, they enrolled patients who had crossed these thresholds of estimated blood loss, um, or if they were hemorrhaging vigorously and deemed to be hemodynamically unstable. The doses I mentioned to you, there they are. Um, if a patient died, the clinicians on the spot determined cause of death. There weren't the type of resources to provide a more robust evaluation of cause of death. So in order to power this trial, and it's an, it was an extraordinary undertaking, they initially said it would take 15,000 patients to provide 90% power to show a difference in that composite primary outcome. Uh, the reason I'm going through the details a little bit more than in your average uh, refresher course meaning is because it was consequential. Um, and by the way, take a look at when your patients cross 1,000 mLs of blood loss in a cesarean delivery, are these the kind of numbers you stare at in your practice? Do you anticipate one in third, 25 to 30 of them not getting off the table? This very different environment that this study was being conducted. Um, one of the problems early in the trial was determined that a lot of patients were getting enrolled right at the decision to do a hysterectomy, and they knew that it would profoundly influence the trial, almost certainly guarantee it to be a negative trial. So it did something that's very unusual in clinical research, and that is they changed the outcome midway which immediately raises red flags with most of us who've done clinical research. Um, but I thought it was reasonable given the amount of investment in resources and effort at this point. They essentially decided, let's increase our enrollment to 20,000 patients, change the primary outcome to hemorrhagic death alone rather than this composite one, um, and then here are the numbers that you would see if that were the case. In this study, patients were dying of hemorrhage pretty close to maybe what we would see. Maybe we would see more deaths from atony than perhaps from, I don't think a, a fifth of our hemorrhagic deaths are uh, surgical trauma or tears, but so be it. It's, you know, it's probably pretty representative of our, of our hemorrhage etiology. Here are the outcomes. You're not used to seeing a clinical trial presented with three different lines of the outcomes. The original outcome, the revised outcome, and the hysterectomy um, portion paired out. This is what they published. This is what all the press was about. This was the hype. And that is, in their revised primary outcome of hemorrhagic death, they just reached statistical significance in reducing um, that uh, Mature, that mortality uh, outcome. Um, specifically, if you look at the patients, 155 in tranexamic acid died, 191 in the group that got placebo. Meaningful. Not insignificant. You know, 36 women, if I'm, uh, or whatever that math is, 30, saved presumably from this drug. Um, a lot of hoopla. If you look at the original primary outcome as they anticipated, it did not show a difference. If you looked at the difference in, hem in hysterectomy as anticipated, it was not any different. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the breakdown of that in a second. But first of all, they also commented not only did this spare women's lives who got this intervention, therapeutic intervention, that those who got it early, um, specifically those that got the drug early versus those that got the drug later after three hours, <coughs> did not see the effect. Um, and I, this, the trials from the, wom the woman trial are actually layered in next to the outcomes from on timing in the crash to trauma trial. And it was kind of similar observations. Um, so they concluded that this saves lives, and it saves lives if administered early. I think another way to potentially interpret this is that early administration could very well given the setting that this is being performed in, been a surrogate marker for quality of care overall. So it's quite possible the timing effect isn't nearly as important as what they're emphasizing, but um, suffice to say that's how they reported it. 
Um, I want to talk about, does this mean anything to you in a high resource setting? I don't think there's anyone in this room who's practicing anywhere that's losing patients at the rate they were. Look at the difference in 400-fold difference in mortality in death from hemorrhage in these two settings. A death rate of 2.6% overall published versus what um, I think some of my colleagues and I estimated putting together several types. Once you start to hemorrhage, what's the likelihood that you die? It's a little bit of a, um, not such a straightforward calculation. Um, there were some differences in obstetric practice overall, but the thing you've got to answer to yourself is, if you conducted this trial in the United States, in your hospitals, if we all pooled our data, I suspect there would be no difference in maternal death related to this. Um, it, you know, the generalizability and the external validity of the study might not be there. That doesn't mean it's not important. Um, probably it would, it would probably lead to its use in a therapeutic uh, setting would probably reduce blood loss, would probably reduce transfusions. It might even uh, reduce hysterectomy or spare fertility. But I think you just need to know some of the dynamics behind that and have a little bit of skepticism. The number needed to treat in the low resource environment was 274 patients. That sounds wonderful. The confidence interval around that calculation is extraordinarily wide. The confidence interval in our environments for the same calculation, as I mentioned, um, is really not something that uh, would pan out, I think, in our trial. The most important thing um, that came out of this had to do with the safety of its use in pregnancy. I'm jumping back to the CRASH-2 trial and talking about, yes, they did um, report a 16 to 14 and a half percent 16% death rate in placebo, 14.5% death rate from hemorrhage in trauma patients. Um, but what they also noticed was that there was no increase. In fact, even there was a trend towards decrease in thromboembolic complications in the group that got tranexamic acid in uh, trauma patients. We all paid attention to that, but we assumed that um, pregnant women were going to be different. They weren't. In fact, start your eye on the right column, the p-value. There are no significant differences in any of these thromboembolic categories between the tranexamic acid and placebo in this high-risk pregnant patient population. Really important. In fact, the most important result for you in your practice environment, that before Whatever you felt about its advantage, prophylactic, therapeutically, your fear of giving that you might lead to adverse outcomes because of this probably can be allayed reasonably with 20,000 women randomized to this. Um, in fact, even if you try to dig a little bit further and look for other evidence, perhaps maybe some renal cortical necrosis, um, you're not going to find it. Um, so I think most of us found we're very reassured by the differences the no evidence of thromboembolic complications. That does stand in contrast to one case cluster that uh, uh, Alex Bowick brought up to me a couple of years ago that he dug this out of. And only Alex would pull something out of um, a kidney journal. Um, but it was a case cluster that was really meaningful. It was 18 postpartum hemorrhage patients who developed clots in their kidneys and un ended up with permanent kidney damage um, after they had received these higher doses of tranexamic acid in some of the French trials. Um, you would expect hemorrhagic patients to have transient reversible kidney in injury. You see this in a lot of your shock patients. What you don't see is people developing blood clots in their kidney and having permanent uh, loss of kidney function. Um, young pregnant, we virtually do not see this in a pregnant population. Something was almost certainly related to the tranexamic acid dosing. And this was evident before the woman trial came out. Maybe it had to do with the infusion, maybe the little bit higher load, but one gram plus one gram bolus doesn't look that different in terms of dose. So if you can hit some of these complications, then the therapeutic index here is narrow, and it should make you worried. Um, yes, there are some, um, looks like that slide ended up kind of funny without uh, shifting from Macintosh to, um, people get seizures who get tranexamic acid in some moderate doses. It's not seen in obstetric patients for the most part. It's seen in cardiac patients. I'm not sure why it's not seen in our patients. The other big point that came out of the trial that um, 
there was a lot of discussion in the year that followed had to do with drug errors and patient safety. Most of us received tranexamic acid in different, um, mine looks a little bit more like um, the way I receive antibiotics in a 100 ml bag. Is that how most of you receive it? And I see some head shaking. Out of curiosity that one of you is shaking, what does it look like in your place? It comes in a vial. Okay, the reason I'm pointing these up here is that these are side-by-side -side vials of bupivacaine for spinal anesthesia for cesarean and tranexamic acid. The reason I'm showing it to you there is there have been, I think approximately a dozen, although I don't have a complete handle on, of deaths associated with the intrathecal administration of tranexamic acid. And it had to do with um, drug swaps related to these similarities. I can think of no more severe drug error than what I'm describing to you. I think, you know, this has been almost entirely a lethal drug error that I think 11 of these 12 minutes that I estimated, all the numbers I'm, I'm not positive on, almost entirely all of them died. Young, healthy women, cesarean delivery, killed by a drug error. Um, so whatever you saw in terms of the difference that this may have made in, the, in low resource settings in terms of saving women from hemorrhage, what do you make of this? This is, I'm describing reported cases of this drug swap error. However you're storing this drug, you probably need to be very thoughtful about it and probably never want to avoid it. It also just reminds you how unforgiving the intrathecal space is. I think I was having a conversation with some of you at the coffee about JACO visits and drug labeling of our syringes while you're doing a spinal procedure. Um, I think it's made me just reflect on or even just mixing fentanyl and morphine with your bupivacaine and just thinking about how unforgiving this drug error is. Um, so where are we? You know, what does one conclude from this? You probably wanted a little bit more from me at this point, but I'm going to take another poll at the tail end here. If you're thinking about using this drug prophylactically for high-risk patients such as those with known placental invasion disorders or you fill in the blank with whatever. Um, some people are doing that. And I think we, we got a sense of that at the very beginning. Um, there is an ongoing uh, MFM network trial essentially addressing just that question that hopefully will have a little bit better guidance uh, in the upcoming years. As far as therapeutic interventions, um, the um, CMQCC, so this um, quality collaborative in California, put out a white paper. I think Alex Butwick was part of the collaborative group that um, informed um, this decision that basically said that, you know, we should be using, they wanted to probably get at people's attention. Um, they had the general opinion that this should not be used as a first-line drug in hemorrhage that may be something further on, but where specifically it fits in the hemorrhage protocol is still not entirely known. Should you have a clinical threshold where you escalate based on an average blood loss? Should you have a clinical threshold that you escalate based on where you are in your hemorrhage protocol? What about using um, either standard labs or the TEG Rotem um, conversation that you just heard in the last lecture? I don't know. I do know of some people who are said, I got to 1,500 to 200 ml blood loss and was escalating my protocol, sent off a tag and had a very reassuring result that there didn't appear to be any um, decrease in fibrinogen or fibrinolysis, and we decided not to give tramexamic acid and got control of things. We're sorting this out at this point. I want to take the audience poll again at the tail end of this lecture. Based on some of the evidence I presented to you, I've rephrased the question. What's your use of this going forward based on the, the evidence that we have now and nothing more? How many, I guess probably very few of you will answer A, how many of you will use it therapeutically in massive transfusion protocols? How many of you will use it earlier um, as a therapeutic intervention perhaps at a second tier? Half about. Um, maybe a little bit less than we're currently using it. How many are using it, prof would you, will use it prophylactically in a plac known placental invasion disorder? Maybe a third of the audience? Uh, and how many are thinking about using it in all cesareans? Not yet. We'll see. I, it's not entirely implausible. <laughs> 
So to conclude, um, the main thing is that there is no increase in thromboembolism in this drug dosing used in the woman trial. But remember the, the narrow therapeutic index, at least as one could infer from the case series. Um, I'm not sure you can argue whether this is going to save lives in the United States, um, but it probably will reduce morbidity. Um, where it fits exactly, I don't know. We'll determine that going forward. Thank you.